In overnight attacks in Ukraine, at least six people were killed and dozens wounded in a Russian missile strike on the central city of Kriviri. The regional governor says a five-storey building was destroyed, with some people still buried under the rubble. In the capital, Kyiv, authorities say air defences managed to stop numerous attacks. The extent of the damage is unclear. The attacks come after Ukraine claimed successes in its counteroffensive against Russian forces. Ukraine's defence says its troops have retaken seven towns from Russian forces in the southeast. The gains reported over the last week are part of Kyiv's new effort to push back occupying Russian forces. The towns are in the Donetsk and Saporizhia regions, which Russia illegally annexed last year. Ukrainian troops released this video, which they say shows them posing with their flag in Storoshevir in Donetsk. Russia's military claims to have repelled Ukraine's attempts to advance in the area. In his nightly address, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said despite rain and fighting, his troops were making progress on the battlefield. The battles are fierce, but our movement is underway and that is crucial. The enemy's losses are exactly what we need. And although the weather these days is unfavorable, the rains complicate our task. Nevertheless, the strength of our soldiers yields results. And I am grateful to each and everyone who is currently in combat, to everyone who supports our combat brigades in their respective ways. I asked military analyst Mike Martin from King's College London how he views the progress Ukrainian forces say they're making. I think the reason Ukraine is citing, you know, towns or villages, settlements that it's taken back is it's, it's a very easy metric to communicate to its Western backers that progress is being made. Uh, but in military terms, what Ukraine is trying to do is to get behind the Russian defences and then to cut the Russian lines of logistics. So in the West, for example, uh, when they're advancing towards Tokmak, the reason they're doing that is because it's a railway junction. And they may not even take Tokmak, they may just surround it and continue. And this is because logistics and cutting the Russian logistics is really the main thing that they're trying to achieve at this stage of the offensive. But how strong is the Russian defence, considering they've had months to prepare for this counteroffensive? Mm. It's, it's a really great question because uh, I'm sure some of your uh, viewers have seen all the satellite images of multi-layered Russian defensive lines. So anti-tank ditches, uh, things called dragon's teeth, which are like these little concrete uh, uh, obstacles, uh, minefields uh, and trenches, of course, with men in them. Um, what's interesting is that it's not quite as strong as we achieved, particularly the dragon's teeth, which were meant to be immovable. Uh, by uh, tanks, uh, some of the Western equipment has actually managed to push through some of those. So the defensive lines, and in some areas they are really, really very complex and, and several layers deep, and they are holding. But in other lines, if there's particularly, if there's one or two uh, of those obstacles, uh, some of the assaults are able to breach them and get through them. We've heard reports of the Ukrainians getting through the first and second lines of defensives in some areas. And do you, are you able to work out any, uh, any sort of timeline for us, how, how long this Ukrainian counteroffensive could actually take? Uh, I mean, this, it, it's crystal ball stuff, Ben. It's very, very difficult. Um, I, I think what we can say is that the Ukrainians uh, throughout this war have been very, very careful with their manpower. They don't want to overly risk it. And we've seen that over the last week as well slow and steady, move forward, identify a Russian position, call an artillery on it to destroy it, and then so on. So they're moving forward in a very methodical manner. But uh, they've got a hard stop. So come October, November, you heard uh, Vladimir Zelensky talking in your package there about the rains. Well, those in October, November will be so severe and the, the winter will be coming in, that will put a hard stop to the offensive. So they need to make progress in the next four months. OK, I also mentioned reports of a Russian missile attack on the Ukrainian city of Kriviri. Um, from, from a Russian perspective, is there any strategic reason for such attacks? Uh, none whatsoever. Um, Russian attacks on Ukrainian civilian targets, I mean, as well as being war crimes, um, 
they're completely ineffective. The Russian thinking goes something like this. Uh, the Ukrainians are a lower type of human than we are. And if we bomb them, if we bomb the civilians, they'll panic and attack and, and cease their military activity. But of course, the opposite happens. The civilians rally round and become more defiant and more supportive of the Ukrainian military, who is defending them from these Russian attacks. So it's really silly. And the Russians should be using those munitions to attack Ukrainian military formations. Mike Martin, thank you very much for putting that all into context from us, for us from King's College London. Thank you. And DW Russia analyst Konstantin Egert joins us from the Lithuanian capital Vilnius. Good to see you there. Mike Martin just described the ineffectiveness of attacks like in Kriviari. How are such attacks justified back in Russia? Well, there is no need for justification for Putin. He just does what he does. Uh, the interesting thing for me is that Krivoyerich is the birthplace of President Vladimir Zelensky. Uh, he was born there in 1978. So uh, it may be a symbolic strike, but then again, it's a major industrial city. It's one of the capitals of Ukrainian metallurgy. So there may be some kind of theoretical reasons behind it, but I totally agree as a former officer, I agree with Mr. Martin, I think that the 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 bulk of the thinking behind this, uh, this shelling is actually just scaring the population into submission. Um, I think it's interesting, Monday was Russia Day, the country's national day, um, and President Putin said that this is a difficult time, but appealed to Russians' patriotic pride. Um, how, how much longer are Russians going to accept the costs of this war? Well, it'll take a long time. Uh, the costs are still fairly light. If you look at the biggest cities of Russia, like Moscow, St. Petersburg, uh, the population is kept in the dark about the real losses of the Russian army. And uh, frankly speaking, it's uh, the majority of it, according to uh, recent polls, uh, shows no interest in this war. 50% of the population do not follow the war. So in such circumstances, I don't think it will be very difficult for Putin to continue his policy. Some interesting figures there from DW Russia analyst Konstantin Egert. As always, thank you for thank the insights. Thanks.